Good morning and good evening, everyone. My name is Priya Saman, and it is my pleasure to welcome such esteemed guests on today's panel discussion titled Entertainment as a Catalyst for Trade and Cultural Diplomacy at the Horace's Asia meeting. Every nation is currently fiercely battling with the COVID pandemic that has brought the economy uh, you know, at a standstill. And there is so much uncertainty in the future of work. Like every other industry, the entertainment industry has also suffered huge losses. But it is one such industry that has kept us alive, active, and bonded through cinema and music. So with that, I would like to open today's conversation with Mr. Baman Irani. Mr. Irani, <laughs> you are a versatile actor and a multi-talented human being. That's the you rumor. have done cinema as well as you have delivered films that have given social messages. Cinema is a tool, you know, which can promote awareness, advocacy. So Hindi cinema has, has, has always had a reach in uh, you know, uh, countries like Middle East, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, and even China. How do you see it affecting the cultural diplomacy in this changing geopolitical times? The floor is yours. Okay, so thank you and, and, and great to be here. Uh, good morning or good evening, whichever part of the world you are. Um, the thing is that when I, when I used to travel abroad and the, people would ask me, which country are you from? And I would say India, they say, oh, oh, Raj Kapoor, or oh, Amitabh Bachchan, or oh, Rajesh Khanna, or oh, Shah Rukh Khan. And, and, you know, that kind of created a bond between uh, uh, the two countries uh, without even knowing anything about the culture, so to speak. But just having a peek into the world of India through the movies. Uh, things, things over the, uh, over the past, uh, say, 30 or 40 years, they they exponentially grew and our movies started you know being seen all over the all over you know russia maybe and europe and africa and the middle east and even uh, southeast asia but it was more or less uh, the popularity came about because of the songs the music and the star power and mm -hmm. and i think yeah and the star power and people love just just as i said when they say oh shahrukh khan and they start saying they start dancing on the street literally dancing on the street and do a jig for you. And I say, this is wonderful. At least they look at us as friends, you know. Um, in the last two years, and I don't think that the, the lockdown uh, and the pandemic has helped in many, in any small way. Uh, last three or four years, I think I don't see a lot of music coming out of our country. And my, my dear friend, Mr. Guy, will, will, tell, will corroborate and Mm -hmm. the films had the best music and I think it reached out. I don't know whether that kind of star power and music is going to help us make this soft cultural touch with other countries. It's going to be the movies. It's going to be the, it's going to be the stories of India that will uh, come to the forefront. However, saying all that, well, uh, culturally, it can uh, help, no question. But if it's going to be politics of personality, I don't know how we can intervene and and you know and be the, the diplomatic core to 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 get two countries together. But yes, in the long run, I think it's always been from my experience going to other countries when people come and hug you and you know, taxi drivers turn on, stop the car, and they say you know. And after I became an actor, it became even more apparent. But it does help. It does help in a big way. Movies, music, dance, culture, always the savior. Thank you so much. So you really uh, brought some <clears throat> interesting point here. So see, traditional, uh, traditionally regional cinema, like, you know, especially in India, like Bengali, Marathi, and even Southern cinema, Malayalam, Telugu, really big right. industries, you know, have handled a wider range of social subjects um, right. compared to the mainstream Hindi cinema, which although is changing now, okay, even um, Hindi, cinema, Hindi cinema is really tackling some uh, key issues. Right. So how can regional cinema uh, get better global reach than the Hindi cinema has today? And moreover, can there be a cross-industry uh, collaboration with the intent of giving that reach? 
All right. Uh, see, for a person who doesn't live in India, uh, I don't think he might know the difference between a Bengali film and a, a Telugu film or a Hindi film. It's it's regional cinema to him. So if we see a film that comes out of Korea, it's regional cinema to him. For us, it is regional cinema because we've got so many languages all across the the the, the nation. But eventually, I was watching a film once with dear friend, mentor, and one of the greats. Mr. Sham Benegal, and there were no subtitles uh, to the film that we were watching on television. And he asked me a very important question and a pertinent question at that. He said, do you follow the movie? Do you understand the movie? I said, yes. He said, do you know the language? I said, no. He said, which means it's a good movie, a really good movie. It, if it has to cross borders and has have legs to cross borders, does not need subtitles. It means the storyteller is telling you the movie perfectly well without subtitles. So where's the language? Uh, it's, it's cinema. It's, it's, the, it's the way the communication is taking place between viewer and the storyteller. So, so your question about regional cinema, it doesn't matter what language uh, the movie is made in, because if it has to have legs to go across and cross borders, Kore Korean cinema, I don't understand uh, the language, but I, I love the cinema, Iranian cinema, fabulous, yeah. fabulous the cinema over the, <clears throat> that's regional cinema for me. It could have been one small part of India and it won't make a difference as long as I enjoy the storytelling, the narrative and the culture of it all. Very well, very, very well put. And, you know, talking about Iranian cinema, uh, at the last panel I did for the UN, during the UN General Assembly for the harasses, we did have Majid Majidi from Iran. Oh, yeah actually nominated for an Academy Award. So wow. now um, you touched upon uh, music as well. So we have a musician in this room today. We are very honored. So my next question is going to be uh, to Ali Sethi. Uh, see, uh, every nation has their own uh, musical heritage. Through music, we are able to empathize with one another, but also borders of language and religion can be overpassed through it. Ali, you are um, uh, an author, you're a Coke studio performer, and of all, because I'm based out of Boston, you're an a alum of Harvard, right? So that's, that's, that's very near to me. Can you tell me, uh, do you think that music can facilitate cross-cultural understanding and promote the message of peace? Uh, I, I not only think I know that from personal experience because I've been performing on uh, the very popular Coke Studio program for many years now. And um, I have seen how, especially in the last 10 years, as Pakistan has grappled with, has been has been shaken by um, by a, a huge militancy problem, by by suicide bombings in my native Lahore, which as we know is an ancient city of the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. I have seen shrines bombed. Um, I have personally lost friends and um, dear ones to uh, terrorist violence, to extremist violence. Uh, my parents who are activists, Najam Sethi and Jukhna Mohsen, they are journalists who have always advocated for regional peace. We have lived under death threat from Taliban, have had to be you know, away from our, our home for years at a time. And through all of this, I have seen how music in particular what we call fusion music, which is kind of really just traditional South Asian uh, folk melody, uh, percussive elements brought together, you know, with some kind of improvisational genius uh, merged with contemporary instrumentation, with some sort of contemporary musical sensibilities and attitudes, which we know they see people are just very good at intuitively. And I think it's because the subcontinent has been an anciently cosmopolitan place. I mean, since the time of the Indus Valley civilization, we know there has been trade with other cultures, other civilizations, and it has always been the case, right, that the Turks and the Persians and the British and the Syrians and Baghdad and, you know, and Burma and China have in some ways converged in the subcontinent via culture. So I have seen how those elements, whether it is, you know, a European instrument like the harmonium or whether it is you know, a new drum machine that somebody's imported from LA or whether it's whether it's a rag being sung in sort of the way they come together and speak a global language. I've seen how not only have they not only has this this sort of musical uh, musical language connected young Pakistanis in particular 
with people around the world at a time of siege and at a time of fear and loathing and strife, but have also healed within. It has been, you know, what politicians and secular activists have failed to do time and again, what sort of, you know, uh, well-meaning uh, 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 parliamentarians have often failed to do. Music has been able to do in a country like Pakistan, which is provide a kind of inclusive sense of cohesion that not only brings people inside your country together and kind of reconciles differences, but also allows you to show that face, that glorious, multifaceted in a country like Pakistan, where unfortunately we've been, you know, constantly um, uh, at the mercy of fundamentalist elements who have insisted on narrow, monolithic, exclusionary identities. Music, traditional music, when done in this contemporary way, has mm. really been able to give us that ability to hold on to the sort of the comedy of nations and cultures. And I can just end with one example, which is that I was um, doing an Airbnb in LA uh, last year uh, to record at a beautiful studio in Hollywood. And I was trying to get this lovely place, which was really expensive. And it was the only place that I could get for those three days because I was late to my booking. And, you know, I was like, I can't really afford this. I want. So I reached out to the woman who was running it, who was a Mexican lady. And she said, I just, I just said, you know, hi, I'm Ali. I'm a musician. I didn't say anything about what. And she said, hold on. Are you the one who sang that song on Coke Studio with Abda Parveen? I said, yes, I am. She said, okay, you get a 50% discount. <laughs> so this Mexican lady who doesn't speak Urdu, who doesn't speak Punjabi, who doesn't really, I don't know, I don't know if she, she might have been a, you know, a recreational scholar of Sufi music. I don't know. But the point is that she was so moved by it, by this thing that, you know, I could feel that I could, that was the moment I felt that I'd done something worthwhile in my life. Good. So, so wonderful. And especially at the times that, you know, we all are in, we, we can know for, from such examples that humanity does exist, right? right? So you have a very dedicated fan base in India as well. Are Hindi films on your mind in your future? Well, right now, all I can think is the songs of Pardesh, which I grew up hearing. I mean, it's just a lot of guys here. And, uh, you know, sometimes I do I do riyaz with my instruments here because of the pandemic. I've been separated from my teachers, the great Ustad Nasiruddin Sami and the Ghazal singer Farida Khanam, who are my teachers in Lahore. Um, and so sometimes in my dreams, I hear I hear... Uh, ragas turning into film songs because of course we know so many film songs are rooted in folk music and in raga and one of the songs that I keep hearing and it just so happens that Mr. Subhashka is here is Do Dil Mil Rahe Hain from Pardes and that's sort of the way it begins and, and I you know really I think that the language of cinema Hindi cinema in particular um, is as, as Mr. Irani said, part of the reason it is so appealing across the board is because it is this, it is this irresistible combine, right, of music, of story, of visuals, of, you know, in the way that the epics have always been performed in the subcontinent. So um, Hindi films are on my mind. How can they not be on my mind? Mm -hmm. Well, and they say there is a time and reason for everything. And this is maybe the reason that, you know, you're here today and you got an opportunity to, you know, be on the platform with Mr. Ghai. So with that, my next question um, is going to be to Mr. Ghai. Uh, education is a part of, uh, you know, a larger modern or new diplomacy movement um, that has been growing over the last two decades. Number of countries are actually now uh, uh, regarding education as, as the best way to uh, promote their uh, in, national interest on a global stage. Uh, Subhashi, you have been a key pillar of the Hindi cinema as well as the film and media education in India. Um, you know, I have grown up watching your films, and uh, uh, the, the melody of Hero is what I want my son to learn. You know, I am coaxing him because he takes music lessons. So, um, National School of Drama, Film and Television uh, Institute of India, Whistling Woods are such successful um, uh, schools for Indian students. As an educationist and a visionary, how do you envision Indian school becoming the power centers, not just for Indian students, but for international students as well? Unfortunately, I cannot see you, but I will answer you what you asked me about this. The let me understand. Let me let us understand one thing. When you talk about the entertainment and it's a catalyst of the trade and the cultural. Mm -hmm. 
let's understand what is entertainment entertainment is a a power to bring out a person and touch his sensitivity sensitivity and sensibility and bring him out of out of his space and tell him something make him listen something and he is in your world the audience leaves the his world and they are with you and you bring them from their own stress from their own thing and that is the most beautiful aspect of life is entertainment because you smile you make them smile and you give them relaxation it's very good spirituality i would say and the trade is always is a left hand hands fire you always calculation mathematics so when they connect to each other you see they create a balance and mm-hmm. when you talk about the cultural part of it, the culture is that uh, and through entertainment which is called telling stories we come to know each other stories mm-hmm. through cinema through drama through theater through poetry through music we we understand the culture of that land whenever i want to understand some culture of that land particular land i just go to the google or go to somewhere where i can see their place their mm. cinema their music their sound and i understand where they belong to and where i belong to and it connects me to as a universal person as a person from the world so mm-hmm. it connects as a as a unified human being not an individual from my land only so the entertainment is such a beautiful space where we really connect and bring a harmony even the songs from enemies you sing mm. even even the place the people who you whom you don't like or whom you whom you debate but you like to watch their place you watch the you like to watch their performances because it is an entertainment so as far as the education is concerned mm. i would like myself being a student of fti Uh, in cinema and my journey as an actor as a writer as a director and as a producer and then the corporate and education is for the last 45 years made me realize that we must connect people internationally through our cinema through our place through our music so that is why i thought of to educate the younger generation that tell your own story to the rest of the world if i have set up this school called whistling woods international in bombay where we have 1100 students at the moment and we have already 3000 to 4000 students already working in the industry so i always tell them that you please tell a story a music of your land to the rest of the world because they don't know india so you tell about their india the how what we are what is our we are apical people we have a history we have a culture we have ancient wisdom so tell everything through your cinema through your plays through your music speeches so create an artistic skill in you so that you are able to tell your story of your land and that was the my main motive that is why i kept his name whistling boots international hmm. means that connect to the all the nation and learn from them the best and give them the best you have or you possess yeah it's a, it's very very well put and i really like the part that you said about the sensitivity and the sensibility in the world you know that that's very important in today's time so um how can film and drama schools be expanded um at a scale in a in region centric manners the way iits have done in last uh, 20 years because you know that that's extremely important the way uh, the entertainment industry is growing um is that even a possibility you see iit have been successful in designing the technology part of it but mm-hmm. how to how to create modules to mm-hmm. connect to so many sphere of life but where the drama or the film is an art is an art artistic development in a human mind and how to look at the people how to understand the philosophy of life how to understand the psychology of people how to understand other cultures so drama and film has a huge contribution in human development i would say 
and that is why when you say about the regional centric manner it has to go because we will come to know the each and every corner of this world in on this earth what is happening and we can create an harmony between the mindset of the people we can create a harmony in the world that is why the drama music everything talks about love talks about emotions mm-hmm. talks about connecting to each other talks about the yoga talks about the spirituality talks about a a positive environment around you so it is extremely important for us to understand that we every and in every village every region must develop theaters must develop film schools dramas even the lawyer and doctors scientists also need to know what is human drama what is the philosophy of life what is the psychology of the current so we understand each other better we have a wider horizon to have a better perspectives from others we can understand others perspective also we can understand why he hates me what is the problem mm-hmm. so i don't become individual i become a person i become above above a normal citizen a normal citizen of the world and when you become that you understand people you are cool about it correct correct so maybe a holistic approach towards uh, diplomacy would be a way to put it put it so with us also we have today um, a leader innovator and a pioneer in the entertainment industry um, in united states and uh, globally mr carry granite so carry it's an honor to have you as well here today uh us film industry has dominated the global industry um however the trade flow is one sided uh, american films dominate the the world market uh have however the foreign films have a very minimal success in uh, establishing their presence in the us market so how do you collaborate with the foreign governments to uh, help set up uh, to help set up or remodel their entertainment sector so they can basically uh, you know uh, in a very seamless manner uh, have their global presence from a trade perspective first off i'm very honored to be on the panel with uh, so many talented cool people whose work i admire so let me start by saying that um entertainment is a obviously a multi multi billion dollar business and um when we talk about cooperation between countries uh one of the things that our company uh, one of our companies does now uh, we've we've made about 58 movies and tv shows in different countries around the world uh over many years and one of the things that we look for isn't how do we just export american narrative actors and storylines it's quite the opposite it's how do we build bridges of bilateral cooperation and trilateral cooperation where many countries are able to work together to bring incredible stories to life so you have a couple of different pieces here number 1 is many countries and we're working today with people in several southeast asian countries where the government don't have incentive rebates don't have bilateral agreements with other countries for preferred theatrical release or entry china for example only allows a certain number of films in a year from any given country or territory so creating unique bilateral agreements with china are critical so that you can bring in both funding programs and what not we do that on a regular basis but also the development of talent and the promotion of talent is really important and um the narratives themselves are critical for geopolitical reasons because they humanize differences they humanize our issues between each other they help to understand and help to break the curse that i like to call we're ignorant that we're ignorant which is the famous arthur schlesinger junior quote which basically we don't even know that we're ignorant right so watching incredible stories uh that take place from different places in the world whether it's a mir costa rica introducing us in the underground to an incredible story or any number of uh uh, uh storylines that you get to meet uh that have that have succeeded allow us to now have an emotional connection to a place and time 
But going back to the economics a second, when we go into a country and help them build up their film industry, their streaming industry, their music industry, we're not only bringing American studios in, we're bringing Russian productions, Brazilian productions. We're looking at how do we activate Canadian uh, treaties with those countries so that we can expand and create more universal kind of theatrical distribution initiatives, streaming initiatives. And I will say that Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Hulu have done an amazing job starting to really create kind of a balance now with international cinema where the rise of appreciation of international cinema has never, ever been this great before ever in the history of uh, cinema and in television. You have people today watching Israeli and Palestinian, and you have people today who never saw the white balloon or never saw wild horses or never saw various projects in multiple countries who are now, uh, 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 you know, grabbing that through word of mouth. So millions of people are being turned on. This is the great equalizer moment we've been waiting for, for international <laughs> cinema and appreciation. Our job with our company is how do we help these countries activate that have never had a steady film industry. Vietnam's a great example. What a young you know, group of, uh, uh, of a country that doesn't have an active, vibrant film industry like India does. Indonesia, picking up steam right now, finally, but has failed to take advantage of you know, their, their, their incredible geography, history, mythology, and themes. More people, forgive me for saying this, I'm sure this will be quoted by the press, more people have watched a nine-year-old video of a four-year-old boy smoking cigarettes out of Indonesia than have ever watched a movie coming out of Indonesia. That has to change. That mm. has to change. We have to do more. When you, I loved what you talked about with regional cinema of India. Of course, people need to understand the difference and the delineation, but that's not going to happen until we have more cooperation. And one of the big mistakes has been an over-reliance on these international film festivals as if these international film festivals are a panacea to anything. They're great. It's great to get an award. I've really loved them in the past, but it's not going to open up international trade and politics, nor is it going to solve when people start to say we have to build a gigantic studio here in this city or that city. What needs to happen is the support of local talent, bridging the talent bases, incentive programs, rebates, coming up with local banks in those countries that know how to do film and streaming support and getting different laws so that contracts make sense to each other. There's just basic fundamental business that has to happen that will take the great artists, many of whom who are on this campaign right now on this panel with us and help them to be known. I have children myself and my friends have children who don't understand why they love a certain piece of content and that it goes back to Miyazaki. They have no clue what Studio Ghibli basically created over many, many years, yet it influenced every aspect, including esports and gaming today mm. in the world, yet they're starting to discover that now and understand. Big opportunity here. I think it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity in many of the countries. I think India, forgive me for saying, can do a much better job with bilateral relationships. It's very difficult to shoot in India when you're a Canadian or an American production. I'm just being very factual with that. It's almost impossible to get support when you're looking to go to Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, any of these countries. Thailand, much easier. But Thailand has not developed the internal base. Hmm. Uh, really, some key points you have brought. You know, and you know, I'm just taking those words um, so that you know I can I can frame um, the narrative later. So, uh, what do you think? Like, which film industry or the media markets in the India in the Asian continent, uh, in your opinion, have matured enough to reach the global audience? Uh, because as you said just now, you know, some of them are really not ready, but which are the ones that are ready who can actually, you know, um, uh, explode or are right. waiting to explode? Well, to this day, the number one Indian movie in the United States is Eat, Pray, Love, an American movie. So I think, you know, I say that half jokingly, but you understand what I mean. And then the second would be Slumdog Millionaire in terms of people who've seen it. So yeah. my point is we need to do a better job helping to export India's culture, 
Number one, Taiwan has developed a over and over again incredible film base of actors mm -hmm. and talent. It's, Taiwan reminds me a lot of Scandinavia in how Taiwan has supported its local artists and has grown that base. Thailand has done a better job than any country in opening themselves up geographically to shoot there, not necessarily to develop a talent base. Mm -hmm. China has become very regional, so it's difficult to kind of navigate China because there's no central way to come in and it's become very uh, isolationist in terms of being able to work there and shoot there. But I do believe that there's quite a bit, I mean, so top countries, India, Taiwan, and then I would say third would be Indonesia, uh, who's moving very aggressively to try and figure out right now how they can uh, grow. I do think, I do think that Pakistan and India have a huge opportunity uh, to bridge some incredible, op you know, incredible, I'd love to see more cooperation between Pakistan and India in terms of bilateral cooperation than with a third country like a Canada or the United States uh, or one of the BRIC countries because it's happening in Israel and Palestine. If it can happen in Israel and Palestine and you have, you know, Banksy and this one and that one and all these different people starting to work together, certainly you can do it in India and Pakistan. Yeah. You have the right people from India to take it forward, <laughs> you know, so the message has been you know, very well conveyed. So now, um, you know, uh, with the sense of time that we have, um, I'm going to ask a common question to all of you. It's going to be the same. Um, and it is more from a human, you know, from a uh, humanity approach. So I'm going to start in the same order that, uh, you know, I opened the panel with. So it's going to be uh, to Mr. Bama Nirani. Uh, what was your most impactful learning uh, during this pandemic? And how are you implementing that learning, um, you know, in your work? And uh, just be uh, short because, you know, we are running out of time. Uh, so. I, I, I'm a traveler. And then very soon in the pandemic, when the pandemic hit us, uh, I realized I'll be sitting at home and I have to smile through it all. And the only way to do it is to learn and maybe to, to teach. So for, for the last seven or eight years, I've been coming to New York to learn screenwriting. And I made myself uh, help myself to a guru in New York, a Oscar winning writer called Alex Dinalaris, who wrote Birdman. And I made him my guru and, and he's been teaching me. And I just thought this would be the ideal opportunity to share. So I've started, a, 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 I'd like to call it a movement called Spiral Bound. And we've just finished 205 two hour sessions during the pandemic. And uh, I think the, 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 the ticket to going international or whatever you've been discussing right now is through the through writing. I think that should be this cornerstone. We can have great stars, great music, great everything. But without good writing, especially with the amount of stuff that's available to us, people are with a flick of a button going to change the icon, not even the channel, just the icon. So it's the writing that's holding uh, everything together. And if we don't pull up our socks as far as writing is concerned, uh, I think we'll be floundering at some point. So I just thought that would be my contribution. So the pandemic uh, asked me literally to to uh, help out and create this wonderful base of young writers. 205 sessions and, and still going strong. We won't stop. Um, and we're going to have an exchange program. Uh, students from New York, I mean America, uh, through some kind of program. And we, we do a cross-cultural uh, exchange of students, which is right on the cards coming up soon, as soon as the pandemic says bye bye to us, and everybody's hoping all the same. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Ali. Ali, what's what? What was the most? Um, you know, I have. Uh, I, I'm somebody who has, I think, spent a long time in uh, in the guild of music and of classical music and of technicalities and music production and theory, and this is the way my mind has tended to work. Uh, but I dyed my hair bleach blonde. <laughs> <laughs> uh, platinum blonde um, uh, a little while ago uh, as a way to kind of shake myself awake um, and in this pandemic in particular I think I have I have uh, tried to jumpstart or kind of kickstart my uh, my daydreaming again I have I have acquainted myself with new media I have downloaded all those uh, apps that I was resisting I am consuming content left right and center and just kind of swimming in it and looking for new things and sort of what you know everybody here has been talking about which is 
what is the way forward in terms of building these bridges, whether it is, as Mr. Irani said, good writing. Well, what is good writing? How do you translate between cultures? How do you tell a story that retains the authenticity, the flavor, the subjectivity, the quirk, the chaska of the particular, you know, while also connecting with uh, questions, pressing identity conversations that people are having in the globe today. So sort of I'm just swimming in it and I'm, I'm, I'm loving the chaos of it. Yeah. What about you, Subhashji? <laughs> You see, I have been brought in that way. When even you throw me, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I you see. I have been brought up in such a way that if you throw me into a mud, I will start swimming, and we found out something in the, out of the mud. Because <laughs> I, for me, any crisis is an opportunity to discover yourself. Wow. And this was, a, this was a very big opportunity for me when I came to know that everything is closed and I have to stay home. It's the end. And I'm very happy that how um, how much I rediscovered myself, I cannot tell you. Of course, the moment I said it is going to be closed, I immediately shifted myself, brought myself from one space to other space. Now I'm here and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to live with it. I'm not going to be scared. I'm not going to be negative about anything. anything. What did I do? I wrote three scripts during this pandemic. Three fantastic stories and new stories um, should, which should be told uh, post 2021. But the best part which I, which I discovered myself, I started writing poems. And I wrote 32 poems in this whole period. 32 wow. poems. Wow. And I never knew that I can write lyrics and I can write poems like this. I just I took it I thought in the morning and I studied my pen. And it happened. It just happened. And of course, I sent my, uh, those poems to my friends for the real approval. And this war every time. And the third thing which I rediscovered is that I can compose music. Because I called my students from my music school is there at Russian Woods. So I said, okay, let's, let's, let's do something on Zoom. So there was a keyboard player, there was a musician, there were singers, the, all the students came to me. I said, okay, I'm sending you these lyrics on two lines. Now you compose, I compose. And let's do one thing. That this is the song I have learned myself from the various genius of music and music, music, music composers like Raman or Lakshmi Ram, Parelal, other people. So I could compose, I composed 12 songs. Wow. 12, 12 songs. For the social causes, for the national causes, for human, for love stories, whatever I could do that. But I, it is so fulfilling. I never, I could never do that because I have been always busy with something or other, the education or, or business or making projects. This was a time when I could talk to myself. I can rediscover myself. I thought, wow, I can write poems. I can write lyrics. I can compose music. I can understand the sound of the music now. So this was my new birth, I would say. Wow. That is why I advise everyone, all, all my children, you must understand this. Every crisis has to give you something. When one door is closed, then the other open. This other is open. But you don't see it. You find out. You, do it. you will come to know that you are a better winner than your past. Wow. So, uh, Kerry, what was uh, your learning? And, I mean, you know, during sure. the I, I'll say it very quickly. My learning was that we're living in an entertainment and media universe right now without relevancy, context, and without curiosity. And right now we're dealing with short hits of kind of popular culture so that when I watch something on a streaming site, I can learn which director didn't like which actor from India or from anywhere in the world. But what I'm not learning is how to learn more about the site, the country, the narrative, the history, and the context of what I'm watching. And I see that as a massive opportunity, both historically going through past libraries of titles and films and going forward to use that and open up that world of opportunity for people to be able to explore with inside the content that they're watching in the deepest way. And that's where I think universities trying to your education could have a much greater role in yeah. helping support that around the world. Got it. 
So uh, we have now three minutes and mm-hmm. fifty seconds left. So even if we go like five minutes over the time, it's okay. So the st- uh, the clock will stop, but the recording will still happen. So we do have a question from the audience that I, I really want to take at least one question. So it says a reason American cinema succeeded globally is that they wrote on a broader popular culture imparted by the country. For example, literature, comic books, and sports. How can other countries compete with that? What is that Indian movies have to attempt to be a globally resonant and relevant uh, consistently? And it's from Mr. Chinmay Bandari. He's a co-founder of, uh, if I can put it, Nyansa. Is well, the name of his company. I can answer one thing to, to that yeah. if I can. Um, Absolutely. Which is that um, for a long time, the number one movie of all time called Avatar was not based on a game was not based on a book and was not based on a sport. It was based on being able to explore themes, frankly, which came from both India to Carlos Castaneda in Latin America to many others uh, tied to how we look at culture and spirituality. So that was a great example of the way to pull from world culture, which Jim does. I've had the honor of working on many films with Jim and I can tell you that he pulls from various cultures from around the world. So I don't think it's limited to those things. I think there will be a blockbuster that's going to come out of India. It just has to be in cooperation and done the right way. And I think there's blockbusters that will come out of many countries. That's what we're focused on in our group to help discover. Right. So anybody from the Indian side want to answer this? Uh, what, what has to be done? Uh, Baman, Mr. Baman. I mean, that was so, so beautifully answered. Uh, mm-hmm. But but I think uh, I, I I think uh, for the first time I'm going to contradict myself maybe. But I think the great advantage was the was uh, the popular language. It could have helped in a big way, and also the I, I don't know. But I grew up on American films that were musicals. I don't know somehow the, we keep coming back to music. For me, the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Gene Kelly, the MGM musicals were, was actually what popularized American cinema. And that was the kind of film that I kept going to watch. So maybe, I don't know, there may be some hidden secret over there. Maybe the musical should come back. I don't know, Ali, if you have something to say about that. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, I was uh, talking or uh, doing a Zoom session with the wonderful Indian director Meera Nair today, who's a friend of mine, and we okay. do music together on Zoom uh, because we both have a love of music. And we were talking about exactly this, about like you know, uh, if we were to tell stories through musicals and and sort of do a musical, what would it look like? How what would the what would the set pieces be? How would we? We're just sort of riffing and jamming. Right. But yeah, I think it's uh, I think you're right. Uh, you know. The musical uh, has, and we know that on on stage, etc., musicals do very well in America. But somehow, in the movie format, musicals have kind of uh, fallen away. But maybe this is this is the opportunity. This is the crossover that everybody's waiting for. A sure. sort of South Asian American collaboration in which the musical gets revived. Sure. So we got an opportunity to hear from uh, this. Um, innovators, leaders, visionary of uh, the entertainment industry. Uh, there should be a holistic approach in you know, uh, how things happen forward. Entertainment is, how, however, one uh, industry that actually speaks the universal language. Through entertainment, we are enhancing and sustaining relationships, growing various sectors like hospitality and travel and tourism, and also creating awareness on the importance about government, healthcare, and education. Entertainment industry is playing a very important role in informing, bridging, educating the masses as countries are finding paths to a sustainable recovery from this pandemic. To sustain and grow post-pandemic, knowledge transfer, Collaboration across uh, continents, uh, you know, countries is the key, and sectors. Every sector must have the ability to transform and work together with the changes this pandemic recovery brings. We are gearing towards the end of 2020, and this year has taught 